This video will be covering high control and dysfunctional toxic relationships. Please watch at your own discretion. The truth is one of my favorite parts of being a therapist is to study and point out different patterns that I see. Patterns can tell us a lot of information about ourselves. Patterns of behavior can either be done in an effort to optimize future behavior, hurt us, harm us, or help us. And much of looking for patterns also can be applied to various groups that are considered high control cultic or high demand cultic groups. Today will be a study of different patterns and different cultic commonalities across most of the high control groups I've ever noticed and seen. Stick around because I'm about to break it all down. Welcome to my channel or welcome back. Either way, I'm always happy that you're here. I'm Rachel Ann. I'm a licensed professional counselor and I make videos of psychological commentary on current events, anti-MLM, anti-scam, and I have a particular interest in cults. When we think about cultic groups, there are often a variety of different groups that can come up for a person or really present themselves to the forefront of one's mind. So when I talk about high demand or high control cultic groups, today specifically, I am referring to multi-level marketing companies, otherwise known as MLM companies, religious cults, new age spirituality cultic groups, or even what is considered the cult of one, otherwise known as abusive relationships between two people or within an abusive family dynamic or family group. The main point here, as I've shared, is that really all of these groups share commonalities and all seem to have specific patterns of behaviors that they follow. And in case you haven't picked up on this yet, the other names that often can be used to describe cultic groups are high demand or high control groups or slash relationships. In all high control cultic groups and high control relationships, I have noticed across the board that in that initial stage of recruitment, there's a little phenomenon that occurs called love bombing. Love bombing is defined by very well as behavioral patterns where at the beginning of the relationship, a partner showers the other with over the top attention and affection. If you notice these behaviors in your relationship or a high control group slash just a group early on, it's important to acknowledge that this is going on, set boundaries, and then potentially walk away. So in these initial stages of recruitment and love bombing, this is when the group may want to spend inordinate amounts of time together and monopolize your time with others. So a lot of times, even in multi-level marketing companies, you're encouraged to attend all of these video Zoom meetings or in-person meetings and really dedicate so much of your time to working that program, to trying to get new clients, to try to sell a product, and then you meet with your upline, your superiors, and try to learn from them. There are often high levels of time constraints placed on an individual and encouraged to be a part of all of these different group functions. And what typically happens is a complete change or shift in personality or level of attention. If you are no longer considered the golden child, which almost always happens because when somebody is engaging in love bombing, they put the object of their quote unquote affection or their victim really as the on that proverbial pedestal, but the person always falls off the pedestal. And once you fall off of the pedestal, you're left wondering, what did I do? How can I get back to being in that golden child status? Or how can I get back to being revered as special or as if I have a gift and so it really creates this pattern of really searching for that same feeling that same emotion that the victim originally experienced when they were being love bombed by that person by that recruiter even. 
The next thing that I have consistently noticed is that all high demand or cultic groups capitalize on a want, need, or a desire that someone has. Now, across the board, this sense of desire, this thing that someone is searching for could be a sense of enlightenment or self-awareness or trying to strive to have peace within. It can be the desire for money or if someone has fallen on hard times, then a high demand group can make promises that their victim will make a large sum of money if they join in in the group and they'll make promises that sound really fruitful and promising. Things of that nature that really capitalize on a person's genuine need or desire for income. There can be capitalizing on a desire for feeling loved or feeling a sense of power. A lot of times in spiritual new age groups, there are there is a person who could be considered a spiritual narcissist who is leading this group and they can tell potential new members or in that initial recruitment love bombing stage, they can tell the people that they're trying to indoctrinate that they're special, that they have this really uncanny power that nobody else has and it really can make someone who feels really unseen in their everyday life feel so important in the high demand and cultic group. Then this is a huge one that I have seen pop up time and time again across the board in many different high demand groups is that most cults capitalize on a person's desire for a sense of purpose. They can really prey on seekers or those individuals who are searching for more in their lives. This falls on a spectrum in a complete range of what different people define as their sense of purpose. We've got the new age or religious cults that really posture to have all of the answers and make promises that they will help the seeker or the new follower find their sense of purpose. And then there are also certain groups that pair all of the above and slap on almost a philanthropic mentality that postures as a group that's giving back to the greater society. And then that becomes very attractive for the seeker, for the person who has that desire to ha help other people and give back to the community. When in actuality, it just becomes almost this manipulation to have people with really good intentions end up becoming swindled or a part of a high control and cultic group. This kind of goes into what I was just saying, but then a lot of times there can also be the capitalizing on somebody's desire to be part of a really worthy cause. Cultic groups I've noticed are excellent at causing people to feel as if they are part of something bigger than themselves. And when you pair in this group mentality or this preying on someone's need for belonging, then you've got this really, really powerful concoction of making someone feel as if they're doing very worthy work, but then they're also in this group of like-minded people who are really out to conquer the world. And it becomes intoxicating. It feels really good for someone who joins and finds this group. The next thing that I've noticed across the board in cultic groups is that there are always multiple levels of inner circles. I talked about this a little bit in a previous video that I did on Teal Swan's inner circle and what we saw in the Hulu Freeform documentary, but I wanna tap into this dynamic here as well. So not only is there an us versus them mentality between the group and the larger society as a whole, but oftentimes in high demand cultic groups, there are structures put in place to create an us versus them mentality within group. Because what this does is keep everyone vying for attention, vying to be part of the upper echelon of the group and vying to make the leader happy. 
certain behaviors and certain group members are seen as aspirational. And so a lot of times in multi-level marketing companies, you will see that someone who is at the 0.1% of the company is part of the diamond, fairy dust, whatever. They come up with all of these different names for when somebody reaches that, that very tiny tip of the pyramid. But when that person is at that tiny little tip, they're again in that 0.1% of the company, but this person is typically brought up on stage at conventions. They are interviewed in newsletters or publications that go out and everyone is encouraged to do the work like so-and-so, do the work like this person did and you can get to where they are. This also goes into creating that confusion. It's a form of gas lighting because of course, and specifically when you are in a multi-level marketing company, they don't tell you that this person is one out of a million. Instead, they almost try to make it seem attainable and then blame you for when you're unable to reach that aspirational point. So in most cultic groups, people often are kept on their toes. Many times people don't always know with complete certainty on where they stand. They can even continue to be love bombed throughout their time in the cult. And the leader can at times show favoritism to one person. The next day they're discarded and brushed aside. A month later, they seem to be back in favor with the cultic leader or the upline or whoever is at the tip of their hierarchy that they fall under in the cult at that given time. But either way, what this continues to do is insert confusion. If somebody feels confused, they are much more easily able to be controlled as well as go through what is really the cycle of abuse where for a period of time, you're in the honeymoon stage, everything feels wonderful, you feel content, you've never been in a group like this, you've never met people like this, you feel so loved and supported, but then slowly things start to shift and it's almost can be an in person perceptible shift. You're not quite sure what's going on, but maybe your leader has stopped texting you as much and you're really left wondering, did I do something or what's going on with me? This is the tension building stage. Then there comes the explosion. This is the same cycle of abuse that happens in DV relationships, but it also can be equated to these cultic groups as well. But in the explosion phase, this is when sometimes you can be called to the carpet for doing something that's super benign, but the group considers you to be going against them or you didn't do a practice correctly, but there's something that happens where you are put on the hot seat and really that us versus them mentality is then encouraged within the group and you're made an example of. But after that, things can circle back to that honeymoon phase and so forth and so on. In order to progress up through the hierarchy in any cultic group, you must demonstrate complete adherence to the group's doctrine. You must never speak out against them. And really everything is meant to show your devotion to the group. Can you handle the heat or do you get out of the kitchen? And if you can handle that heat, then oftentimes you're regarded as really strong and important and just seen as a better devotee of the group, someone who the nefarious group leaders can deem as trustworthy and so you're able to move up in your stature within that group. This one is pretty basic, Cultic Groups 101, but I did have to include it because it's so important in this specific context. All cultic groups capitalize on our innate human need for belonging. This goes all the way back to Abraham Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, Psychology 101, where Maslow basically postured that all human beings have psychological, physical, and emotional needs, and the need for belonging falls right there in the middle. So there's really this hierarchy of needs, and belonging is pretty much in the middle, telling us that it's a pretty big need that all human beings have. We also know that having this sense of 
of belonging is really a multi-layered need. And as it says here in verywellmind.com, a sense of belonging involves more than simply being acquainted with other people. It's centered on gaining acceptance, attention, and support from members of the group, as well as providing the same attention to other members. The need to belong to a group also can lead to changes in behaviors, beliefs, and attitudes as people strive to conform to the standards and norms of the group. This is so fascinating to me because it just goes to show that no human being is immune from a sense of belonging. Being human and having certain needs, they all fall on a spectrum. So as you're watching, think about where do you fall in your need for belonging in terms of your own life? Have you been driven to join various groups, whether they were religious, new age spirituality, multi-level marketing, companies and did it give you that sense of fulfillment or did you recognize wait this group really capitalized on my inherent need for belonging and used it against me so it's just really important to know that about yourself where do you fall on that spectrum when it comes to having a really strong need for belonging at the end of the day as it says here in verywellmind.com this need for belonging can very much drive our behaviors and the actions that we take. In fact, this can even start to change our attitudes that we have on certain things. So whereas before you were strongly against something, once you join a group and it fulfills that need for belonging and you've gone through the process of being love bombed and you feel really supported, then you can start to abandon previous attitudes or dislike likes of something or likes of something and start to just change your personality. This is also a whole other theory of the personality, pseudo personality that can happen once you join a high control cultic group, but I'm going to save that because I've already talked about it in several other videos. Back to cult commonalities, oftentimes there is really a strong use of shock value that's present, which then allows for desensitization to start occurring. Truthfully, in these cultic groups, no one comes out at the beginning of you joining a group or even becoming involved in a romantic relationship or a relationship in general and says, Hi, welcome to the cult. You are about to be very highly manipulated and potentially go through the cycle of abuse. No one says that. Instead, members are often introduced slowly into the more darker aspects, the dysfunctional, unhealthy aspects of the group or the romantic relationship. And it's often an insidious, very slow trickling in effect of using certain language, saying certain things that are shocking. And what that does is eventually wear someone down so that they start to become more open to certain acts. They start to think that it's okay. Things become more normalized. So when we hear the word desensitization, this is actually a concept that involves establishing a new, more desirable, conditioned response to a trigger. In other words, changing the old trigger to a new one. This also, as you can see, ties in very nicely to the fact that if you couple someone's need for belonging with this act of introducing harmful elements and using shock value, but doing so slowly, it can start to desensitize someone to the process of becoming indoctrinated into a truly dysfunctional or unhealthy group. So in these high control cultic groups, the use of shock value occurs. There is a new practice that's being implemented that feels overwhelming, yet the person in the group is looking around at everybody else and they are so gung-ho and supportive because everyone also has been conditioned to not speak out against the group. The person is then silenced and they think, gosh, I must be the only one feeling like this. 
let me zip it and keep my thoughts to myself. Everyone seems really supportive of this new rule. See, there is a true progression of desensitization, of wearing a person down, of very artfully having someone be that support person within the group who is paired with that person to assure them, oh, this is what is supposed to happen. This is good for you. Or your ego is talking too much. Your ego is getting in the way of your healing. Just go along with what we're doing here and so forth and so on. There's all different ways that this can manifest itself. This is interesting because this is the very technique that can be super helpful and help people overcome phobias, help people overcome PTSD flashbacks and being triggered, you know, being desensitized from some maladaptive response that somebody engages in due to PTSD or something of the like. But on the flip side, this can also be a very nefarious practice that high control cultic groups can use to obtain what they want, to obtain total control over one of their followers. In many high control cultic groups, another facet of desensitization occurs when followers are sleep deprived, they're hungry, and what can happen is that the individual is exposed repeatedly to certain information, certain propaganda that the group is putting out. This just becomes something that's called psychic driving. And it's basically taped messages, whether it's an actual person speaking them or it's a literal movie that people have to watch, something of that nature. And these are played for hours nonstop. Oftentimes the victim or survivor is in a state of consciousness that can also be altered by sleep deprivation, sensory deprivation, and or inadequate nutrition. And so this is just something to also watch out for if you ever decide to go go to a specific group and you notice that you're kept in one very cold room all day long, you can't leave the room, you, you know, you're just very under this tightly controlled environment. This is just a perfect opportunity when you're hungry or exhausted for messaging to kind of seep a little bit deeper into your consciousness to kind of become normalized. In sum, the last thing I'm gonna say about this use of shock value and desensitization is that dysfunctional and abusive behavior often becomes normalized in these high control cultic groups. In most cases, treatment of members worsens with time and control is increased. There becomes a higher and higher level of abuse or maladaptive treatment. The next piece of these high control cultic groups that I have just seen so many different times as I'm sure that you have watching and that is the leaders of the cult often buy into the cultic belief publicly, but they also doubt or live very much out of accordance privately and behind closed doors. At the root of hypocrisy is fear and low self-esteem, which oftentimes is at the root of someone with narcissism. It is interesting that when we look at leaders, you can see many of the traits, that grandiosity, that inflated sense of ego, that ability to be charming, they all really, really come forth so strongly. So. At the root of hypocrisy though is also fear and low self-esteem, much like narcissistic personality disorder. We use hypocrisy to avoid looking at our own shortcomings and figure out our, our part in it. Isn't that just so true for high control cultic group leaders? In order to rationalize their behavior, I believe that this almost causes them to live in this double life so that they can avoid even fully viewing themselves and continue to view people also in a totally different way. They have a really uncanny ability to compartmentalize how they live their life versus what they're telling everybody else on how to live their own life. So this typically can stem from a sincere belief that we should not be held to the same standards as others because we have better intentions. Our belief is juster, nobler, and sincerer. And this is in reference to the individual who's engaging in hypocrisy. It can 
feel good for people to feel morally superior to someone else. It can also just be like the peanut butter to the jelly of a sandwich when somebody who has narcissistic personality disorder is regarded as special, as a leader, and as really important. That image can be so important for that very dysfunctional person that at all costs, they want to continue to do what they're doing on the side, but they also want to get that public affirmation and recognition at the expense of anyone, really. When someone feels morally superior to other people, it can help the person to avoid humility, which can be a painful emotion, as well as becoming embarrassed and acknowledging such. No one's perfect, but the high control cultic leaders will posture as if they're perfect. The other thing I've noticed about cultic leaders who really engage in hypocrisy is that they're at the end of the day they're they're quote unquote just regular people they're not really anyone who has all of the answers to life's questions because no one has all the answers to life's questions no one knows it all yet this individual has worked so hard to build up again the image that they have all these answers that it prevents them from even really being who they really want to be because they become so rooted in what they feel a leader should look like and a leader should be instead of just letting the mask come off and be quote unquote just a regular person. Their image is the most important thing above all else for someone who is in charge of a cultic group and by all means they will engage in, in hypocrisy so that they can avoid being recognized for who they really are and still maintain that public posture of being this almighty leader even if it's at the expense of other people which leads me to the next cult commonality and that is that members are both dispensable they're in many ways just able to be thrown away at the drop of a hat Yet they're also necessary for a cult to fully survive. When we think about how cultic members are ultimately dispensable, it often comes in the way that when a member starts speaking out against a group that they're in or a cultic leader, they're cut from the group. They're excommunicated, they're turned away, everyone else shuns them, or they're considered to be bad and so we don't talk to them because they're just negative, so forth and so on, yet they must replace that person with someone else. And so there's this constant push-pull where members are both brought into the fold, then shamed or mistreated over and over again. There can be frequent displays of hot and cold behavior towards the follower, towards the member, which goes into that member, once again, never fully knowing exactly where they stand. This almost always creates it's an internal uncertainty, a very uncertain sense of self where, as I've touched on previously, when somebody is experiencing high levels of self-doubt or confusion that often comes from being gaslit, that person is much more easier able to control. And so the cultic group absolutely needs members to be successful. There has to be a following for the cult to function. But at the same token, if that member truly begins to speak out against the group or engages in dissent or questioning or disagreement, then that member is without any warning ostracized from the group and let go and other people are encouraged not to speak to them because they have the wrong idea and will infiltrate the current members minds with their own negative thinking. As you can see, it's very paradoxical, but then much of cultic groups are a paradox and very all or nothing type thinking. You're either fully one of us or you're not one of us at all. There's not really a lot of room to be a lukewarm member of a high control cultic group, especially if you want to eventually rise to the top of a rank or you want to get in good with the cultic leader. So again, it taps into different individuals' senses or needs for belonging or different individuals' drives or level of indoctrination that eventually becomes that person. Some people can stay on the fringe of a fringe group and be just fine and have their own sense of fulfillment, where something else gets lit inside of 
a different member and it ignites this fire where they feel propelled. They want to be at the top of the pyramid in the MLM group. They want to be the spiritual new age leaders right hand person or, you know, they want to get in with the pastoral group of a religious cult and so forth and so on. It's just very, that's a part that's really always been fascinating to me, how different people are affected in these particular high control and cultic groups. And it just speaks to the fact that we're all different. We all have different needs. We all have different backgrounds. There are different layers of trauma that then can affect our ability to form relationships, or there can just be different personality types that people have that can affect the outcome of being in a cultic or high control group. The next cult commonality far and wide is that cultic groups also are able to give members a sense of identity. High control groups often readily and easily supply a purpose to the seeker, to the follower. This is also so manipulative because when someone is truly wanting an answer to a major life question, or if we take it all the way back to something that can make any single person vulnerable to joining a high control cultic group is when we are in a high state of transition in our lives or we have just gone through a major loss or you've gone through a divorce or you are moving to a new city for the first time, then it can be really, really easy to start to have a shaky sense of self or to feel uncertain of what your identity is. And so then you find a group that really postures as having this perfectly laid out plan and it can be a really, really easy trap to fall into. Anyone can be susceptible to falling prey to a cultic group, depending on where a person is in their life. So why exactly is knowing this important when it comes to the fact that high control cultic groups readily supply an identity? There were a couple different researchers, Dominic Packer and Jay Van Bavel. I may not be pronouncing his name correctly, but they became very interested in social groups, identity, and how they impact us and how they can transform society. They found that what is hardwired as humans is our readiness to affiliate with groups and to join up with others. This idea that we are in this together or we are joining for a common cause or in a shared interest creates a common identity. This is something that most people, I have no doubt, have experienced at some point in their lives. The reason I'm also bringing this up is because as they even share here, understanding identities empowers you to choose whether and how much you want to participate. Cultic groups do a great job of making a person feel like there is no other identity. But at the end of the day, no one ever has to be locked into one specific way of thinking for the entirety of their life. So it goes on to say that you have a lot of agency. People can exploit identities and really rile you up on the basis of an identity. It's really important to recognize the power of the identity. You can then exert choice. Is this an identity I want to get riled up about or not? So when it comes to leadership of groups, there are some specific factors to an effective leader. And these leaders are most effective when they they generate a shared sense of identity and purpose among followers. They can harness identity principles to inspire and motivate members of their group for good or evil. And high control cultic groups, again, are expert at creating that shared sense of identity, which then goes into a person feeling like they're a part of a group that's bigger than themselves, that is going to really help change the world. Yet this is where a leader can use and exploit members for negative reasons, for their own selfish desire. Last thing I'll share about this is, of course, transformational leaders aren't inherently positive. Some of the most notable examples of transformational leaders in history are 
unfortunately, people who inspired great atrocities. I'm sure you can think of a couple as I'm going through this. What made them powerful was their ability to exploit and capitalize on these kinds of identity dynamics. Recognizing that rhetoric and when identity forces are in play can help people make discerning choices and actions, which may even include fostering different identity dynamics. So the red flag for me is if you join a group and over time or even initially from the beginning, they are making guidelines about what kind of identity you need to take on. This goes into Stephen Hassan's bite model, which I encourage everyone to become familiar with, where you are being encouraged to have a certain dress, to maintain a certain routine, to use certain language, because all of that goes into helping to reshape someone's identity. And sometimes these things can be used for good to help someone, but in high control cultic groups, we know that this is very much used to manipulate individuals for unhealthy reasons, or most of the time, reasons that are not meant to be in the member's best interest. The second to last cult commonality that I wanna share is that across the board in high control cultic groups, the use of shame is almost always present. This can be overtly or covertly. Many times in new age spiritual groups, religious groups, multi-level marketing companies, certain emotions are viewed as bad. So if you are experiencing doubt, if you are experiencing depression, you're seen as a weight to the group, a negative weight. You are seen as somebody who isn't playing along with the program and you must suppress that emotion. That's your issue. Turn on the toxic positivity and we're only here to do good and talk about good. This is a great way to make someone feel an immense amount of shame for experiencing what could otherwise be a very human emotion an experience of being human that we all have. When we really take a deep dive into shame and the role that it can play with behavioral modification or behavioral change, shame typically comes up when a person looks inward with a critical eye, evaluates themselves harshly, and often does so for things that they have little control over. This is the big issue that I have with particularly new age spiritual groups who often use a lot of shame without taking into account very realistic differences that people have, which then awards different people different levels of opportunity. Instead, they basically tell all people that you don't work hard enough, that you should be able to over overcome whatever's put in your path when it doesn't take into account the realistic barriers that can be at place for various people or even not having a certain amount of income. And it just becomes very out of touch with the reality of a situation. So oftentimes the roots of shame can create a negative self-evaluation that has its roots in messages that have been received from other people with particular emphasis on childhood. Yet as an adult, this can also be further exacerbated by the people who we end up surrounding ourselves with. If they're constantly shaming you, and then if you've also had difficulty in childhood, or maybe you had a great childhood, either way, this can start to shape the new way that a person views themselves. Shame centers on the very identity as a person, and it becomes very toxic when it starts to impact your sense of self. If we look at this through the lens of being a part of a high control cultic group, this is confounded when it we realize that that cults already supply this identity for a, a person and then the person joins the group and they are shamed, which then goes into further impacting their identity. Yet the group then continues to make these promises. We have this perfect identity laid out for you. Naturally, the person starts to potentially abandon old beliefs and attitudes that they once have and are rebuilt into what that group really wants them to be.
Last but not least, when it comes to shame, a couple things to keep in mind is that there are some impacts of shame that can occur and these can make you feel like you're flawed or there's something wrong with you. It can lead to social withdrawal. It can lead to addictions. It can cause you to become defensive and then shame others in return. It may cause you to inflate your ego to hide the belief that you don't have value. It can be related to depression and sadness. It may leave you feeling empty, lonely, or worn out may lead to lowered self-esteem may lead to perfectionism or overachievement to try and counteract your feelings of shame may cause you to engage in people pleasing cause you to avoid talking because you're afraid to say the wrong thing may cause compulsive or excessive behaviors many of the impacts of shame can create this perpetual and vicious unhealthy cycle where you feel the shame, you engage in working harder to try to make it go away. There must be something wrong with you. So I need to work the program harder. I need to devote more time to this multi-level marketing company, or I need to donate more of myself to the cult. And then you don't receive the effect that you set out to receive and boom, the cycle starts. Okay, I must do more to counteract this bad feeling of self. And it just, it's a nonstop cycle of really never feeling like you can do enough or that you are enough and can really spiral out of control if not careful. So then I also just want to throw up really quickly some other tenets of being shamed and what this often looks like and what the after effects of feeling shame can be. And so take a look at this table and there are just a couple different characteristics. I won't go through all of them today but I did want to put it up there. Last but not least, when it comes to commonalities between all cults is that recruiters come in all different forms. Recruiters are interesting and they are often very chameleon-esque in their ability to kind of morph and change and find out what is going to make that potential new member or follower become a part of the group officially. So they become really artful in the language that they use, even in their dress, in their ability to hype a person up or engage in that love bombing and really sink those proverbial claws into the person. But really recruiters are in and of themselves their own form of manipulation. Sometimes I have wondered whether or not individuals who are recruiters are functioning based upon their own trauma or unhealthy interactions that they have had from being in the group because most of the time when people join a cult, they are joining with the best of intentions and they themselves are not bad people. Yet once they become indoctrinated, there can be changes that take place. And so trauma can always cause this sense of hypervigilance, even being more attuned to emotions of others, which goes into being a really good chameleon and being able to shift to meet somebody else's emotions and almost engage in that mirroring effect, which can instantly increase a sense of familiarity within people. And so this also can go into a recruiter potentially being able to better communicate with a potential new member and also go into figuring out what is most important to this potential member and how can the recruiter capitalize on this. So I found a really, really interesting study from the National Library of Medicine entitled Elevated Empathy in Adults Following Childhood Trauma. It says that results across samples and measures showed that on average, adults who reported experiencing a traumatic event in childhood had elevated empathy levels compared to adults who did not experience a traumatic event. Further, the severity of the trauma correlated positively with various components of empathy. These findings suggest that the experience of a childhood trauma increases a person's ability to take the perspective of another and to understand their mental and emotional states and that this impact is long standing. So this particular article shares information about how childhood trauma can increase an individual's level of empathy. But I also, part of me believes just based upon my own work that this could be generalized to somebody who's experienced 
experienced trauma across the board, no matter what age you are. And when somebody experiences trauma, it does increase that sense of hypervigilance or just being really attuned to the environment around them, depending on the trauma that they went through. This is naturally kind of one of the symptoms of even formal diagnosed PTSD in that people can feel really on edge, they can constantly be on high alert, but then as this study shows, it can also create an emotional high alert of sorts where people are able to better put themselves in someone else's shoes, which is definitely a talent that a recruiter must have in order to get them to come into the group and eventually become indoctrinated into that group. This list of cult commonalities is by no means exhaustive. There are so many other traits and maybe I'll make a part two eventually, but for now I just wanted to share these main cult commonalities that I just continue to see time and time again. Last one I'll talk about, because this one is kind of optional, some cultic groups don't just come out and say this. The leader doesn't just come out and say this, but oftentimes the leader will declare that they have a direct line of contact to God, a higher power, or that they are our God or the exalted being, the enlightened one, something of that nature. And in other cases, the leader postures as being all-knowing or having all of the answers. In fact, I think this one is pretty much a, a prerequisite for being considered a high control cultic group that most leaders posture as having all of the answers. Just a few helpful pieces of information. If you are wondering whether or not you're in a high control or high demand cultic group is to be able to ask questions, recognize, is there shame present if you try to leave? Truly your individuality should always be honored and you should be allowed to express any opinions that you have that may be different than the group. So what other commonalities have you seen? I would love to That's hear. That's all I got today. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to support my channel in a different way and receive a tangible good, please feel free to take a look at my spring store. The link is down below where I do have a selection of mental health inspired merchandise with some self-affirming statements. With each sale of an item, $1 is donated to a local charitable organization that's dedicated in providing mental health support to the community at large. Thanks so much for being willing to take a peek at my spring store and thank you so much for being here. Feel free to check out my psychological commentary playlist if you enjoy videos of this nature and as always be well.